Good morning. My name is Denise Coventry. I'm a registered dietitian in Scottsdale, Arizona. Uh, a couple of days ago, I was able to successfully defend for my master's program, and the committee had asked if I would go ahead and go back and record the presentation so that we could go back to review it at a later time. So that's what this is today. Let me see if I can share my screen with you. Here we go. Let's get started from the beginning. Here we are. So let's talk about the dilemma of critical care needs and predictive equations, in particular, how this relates to protein, respiration, and the wound. I think that if you are working on an applied project or your thesis, this is something that you can really relate to. Every meeting that you have, uh, <laughs> It seems as though uh, perhaps others are pointing out a few little loose ends that you're probably going to have to be a little more explicit on. I thought that was really cute. Well, why don't we get started? In terms of an introduction, um, critical care patients have unique needs and nutrition support, depending on the stage, the severity, and the present of the presenting condition. A dietitian's successful assessment and intervention is going to rely on their knowledge base, the skills that they have, the judgment that they're able to apply, and also this uh, proposal to use direct measure tools to help with a strong assessment. So the hypothesis really is to identify if direct measure TUN will help guide interventions in a rapidly declining patient. So the research question, this is a clinical case dilemma. Are predictive equations insufficient in estimating protein needs in the critical care patient? And if so, what are the uh, promising alternatives? We already know that the gold standard of assessment measurement is going to be with the indirect cal calorimetry, but I'd also like to introduce you to the TUN. Uh, and if you don't have a lot of strength with respiration and you do have a mechanically ventilated patient, I would love for you to learn some very basics about it, and I think it'll help open a window of, of uh, knowledge, you know, and then also the size of the wound measurements. So let's talk about background on this particular patient that the case review is about. Now, botulism is an endotoxin, extremely toxic endotoxin. It creates this endotoxin called Clostridium botulinum. There are multiple strains of it and four major types. There's an infant, you've heard babies are not supposed to have, for example, any kind of honey, you know. There's an intestinal form, food contamination, and that would be something we probably are very well known, I have knowledge about in terms of like a um, canning operation. And then there's a wound obtained botulism, and that is what we're gonna focus on today. Wound obtained botulism is one that has, it is, it is rare, but it is becoming more prevalent, and some signs and symptoms for you will be interesting to learn about, I'm hopeful. Wound obtained botulism occurs when the botulism is introduced inadvertently through drug use. Typically, it's injected just below the skin or into the muscle, and you find that this is correlated strongly with the use of heroin, and in particular, black tar heroin. What makes this so dangerous is that it is a germinating species. There is a cell wall that recognizes the hostility of the environment and wants to um, immediately create additional spores, and that's the germination process. When the hostile environment is recognized within about six to seven hours of that, the cell cycle has continued to the extent that spores spill out of that mother cell, and those spores are then able to travel through the bloodstream and perfuse to different cells within the body. In particular, it is the cranial nerve area and the areas of respiration that are 
are most likely to succumb to those spores. There are presentations of symptoms when individuals are seeking help at the hospital that relate to difficulty breathing, a very slow speech pattern, they're unable to swallow, they have dysphagia, and they're also unable to project their voice. Now, what about drug use in the United States? According to the National Survey on Drug Use and Health among persons age 12 and older, you can see that the total drug use over 2017, 2018, they project values of those who have a lifetime use, those who have use within the past year, those within the past month, and you can see the difference between the illicit drug use and specifically heroin. Now, how does the botulism work? If you can take a look at the segment where on the left-hand side, this shows the neuromuscular junction and the axon terminal, you can see little circles with dots in that, and then you see the muscle cell below it. Those little circles uh, with the dots are vesicles. Inside of the vesicles are the communication, um, um, like chemical called acetylcholine that is able to cross this junction and tell the muscle cell that it's time to contract. Now, if you go just below into the normal transmitter release neuron, you can see how these snare proteins that are blue, yellow, and purple act as little docking mechanisms to align this vesicle with their little docking station. Now, once they have met that membrane, the vesicle is able to open and release the acetylcholine, which then accesses its receptor site, and those little acetylcholine messengers then are able to communicate fully with that muscle cell to contract. Whereas on the right-hand side, if you look at the action of botulism, and tox botulism toxin, you'll see that the little black section cones are the botulism and they can cleave the snare protein so no docking is available for the acetylcholine to leave the vesicle and communicate with the in the neuromuscular junction with that muscle cell. Not only does it stop that snare protein and allow that vesicle to dock, but it is entirely blocking the receptor site so that no acetylcholine is able to cross at all. It happens, it is a presynaptic uh, blocking mechanism where the communication is stopped. Okay, the case presentation that I wanna to mention to you is about this 32 year old female who presented at the hospital with difficulty breathing, and this was in a very small town. She had normal vital signs. She was stable. She was 100% of her ideal body weight, 63 inches height, 50 kilos. Uh, her medical history, though, was an admitted occasional use of drugs for weight management. At some point within the next five days or so, it was suspected that this may be attributed to botulism, but she appeared well-nourished. So upon the examination, it was discovered there was a one centimeter, just a small thigh wound. She was presenting with this descending paralysis and she was unable to protect her airway and had to be uh, placed on mechanical ventilation. She had a single 100 degree spike in temperature. And at that point, it was found that she was high uh, he know, hemodynamically stable and she was able to transfer to a long-term acute care uh, center where the dietitian was then able to um, help, help her over the next three months, couple of months, I would say. She arrived with a, an UltraCal 1.0 via Duotube enteral feed. Now I'm going to see if I can Looks like I have like this little picture in the way, so I'm just gonna try to move it, I'm not sure. We'll just do that. What I want you to take away from this, this image on the right-hand side is that 
this person did not have typical presentation of a massive infection. And yet, because she has to go on to mechanical ventilation, we typically know from working in our environments that mechanical ventilation is one of those very serious um, additions in care where there's, there's something that we know that, you know, you're very hopeful they can get off as soon as possible. And you know something about this idea of if they're on for more than a couple of weeks, then it is very difficult for them to wean. So a part of the process that makes this so difficult for in critical illness is that you are already concerned about the ebb and the flow phase of a hypermetabolic situation. But in addition to that, the body itself, it's been presumed that there is this lysosomal autophagy or autophagy that is part of this process. And that is where these cells act like little kamikaze cells and they go to areas where there is dysfunction within that muscle cell. And the, the primary uh, goal is to make certain that the energy that is available is going to just deal with the most primary foundational uh, systems within the body so that the, that these fuel sources are available to bring this person back to their homeostatic state. So anything, it's almost like pushing the gold off the ship when you're in the sinking situation. So anything outside of that, uh, that is already dysregulated can be uh, your own body turning against it to unload it. And so that can cause severe atrophy in that muscle. If you look at the picture of the skeleton, the muscle here is the diaphragm. And just imagine how thin that is and how little, you have very little space to lose any of that before the concave shape begins to change to something that does not have that billowing effect any longer. Uh, you know that inflammation is occurring. You've got tumor ne necrosis factors. You have oxidative stress itself that is also contributing to that respiratory weakness. So she had some results completed. Her results came back labs within normal limits. She had no improvement with her breathing, was still mechanically ventilated. Again, there was that 100 degree spike in temperature. Her weight was stable. Uh, by the point, it was about five, seven days into her stay that that thigh centim uh, one centimeter thigh wound had resolved. And it was obvious because the dysphagia was not changing, because, you know, she's on ventilation, she can't eat, have intakes orally. She needed a more long-term um, source or access point for her enteral nutrition. And so it was decided they needed a peg. She was only able to respond at this point with eye blinks and just very little finger movement. Maintains that mechanical ventilation. She was placed on some antibiotics, really because they weren't absolutely certain of what she had, um, but decided we absolutely are going to need an indirect calorimetry to measure her metabolic energy expenditure. Um, and then a TUN was ordered on day nine. Uh, TUN is something that will be able to measure total urinary nitrogen excretion that we will visit about in a bit. Unfortunately, the thigh wound resolved, but there was redness on the coccyx skin, and it was beginning to uh, look as if the skin integrity was most certainly changing. So what is the big dilemma? The big dilemma is really about fourfold. First, you have these standard, well-accepted guidelines um, provided by Aspen that we know somewhere between, say, 1.2 to 2.0 grams of protein per kilogram are gonna be utilized to help our patients make that turnaround unless, unless it's like a thermal injury or a severe traumatic injury. But in this particular situation, there just really isn't a lot of data about how, how far, how much, how, what is the distance that you can go with protein provision. The next piece of it is if you know that your patient is declining and you are trying to, you're not looking to be a maverick, 
you don't want, you know, nephrotoxicity, possibility of uremia or azotemia. Um, and it's, it's this really, you know, deep concern that you have for their safety, as well as for them to even have an opportunity to be able to walk away from this. Um, the other concern is this person's ventilated. And we know that if you overfeed, and typically with carbohydrates uh, in particular, that you're going to um, help or contribute to your body producing additional carbon dioxide. If that patient is already on mechanical ventilation, you can, you're not looking to increase the workload for them, for them to have to blow off that carbon dioxide, especially when the modes are set, the, the settings are already existing. So, you know, you're fearful of prolonged weaning. And then lastly, the wound, is there something inside of the wound? What is making this deteriorate? Is it just catabolism? You know, is there a fear of developing, you know, issues with their immunity? Because you already know that their protein sources are being reprioritized for other, you know, uh, inflammatory markers and things like that. So the concern is that, is there, is there a possibility that that indirect calorimetry and predictive values can underestimate the changing needs, you know, as evidenced by wound deterioration, for example. I'm going to move my little picture over here a little bit. Okay, so what exactly are the risks of overfeeding and underfeeding? Um, this is adapted from Aspen. From overfeeding, we, we were just talking about, you know, the concern for weaning from ventilation, developing hyperglycemia, we know, we know that uh, in, under conditions of stress, your body is going to produce additional fuels and change the substrate use. Um, they're not gonna be able to meet their hydration needs in the same way. Um, the, the development of fatty acid delivery into the liver um, and electrolyte imbalance. Whereas underfeeding, and I, I just keep thinking about this patient on the, respira, on the um, mechanical ventilation, that she doesn't have muscle to lose, you know, and she's entirely, she's paralyzed and on a ventilator. It's, it's her respiratory strength is going to diminish. Um, she's going to have decreased ventilatory drive. She will have altered organ function, poor wound healing. Those transport proteins, the liver is going to reprioritize everything to try to make lots of inflammation forms of proteins to signal the body that, gosh, we need to get to these areas because there's something very severe occurring and, you know, increased risk of infection. Body's prioritizing her to simply be able to stay alive and, and improve her, um, you know, likelihood of being able to, again, walk out of the hospital. Okay. So when it was decided that we've got to be able to get that uh, indirect calorimetry to get a better picture, what exactly is being, is being uh, measured? When you have an altered metabolic response, you are utilizing those substrates very differently. And when you're trying to determine what type of formula to select for enteral nutrition patients, you are really wanting to know what the substrate use is. Are they so catabolic that they're utilizing, you know, just stripping their muscle tissue down? Um, is, the, is the hypermetabolic state so significant that their needs are not being met and they could actually be in a ketotic situation? You know, we just don't know these things. So the indirect calorimetry can just provide wonderful results, especially, you know, if you can have a series of them and get them daily or every couple of days. Uh, for those who have not had an opportunity to use them, it does require a steady state, meaning that you don't want that patient to be agitated. You try to get them in a, a state of comfort and calm, uh, lights dim. You're not gonna take the first five to 10 minute reading. Uh, you're going to exclude any uh, of the reading that shows greater than a 10% uh, movement of variance on either the oxygen or the carbon dioxide side of it. 
And what you're measuring is that respiratory quotient. It is a ratio between carbon dioxide that is being exhaled versus the oxygen that is coming into the body. So it's going to measure the change of that oxidation in the substrate. The oxygen is going to enter into that Krebs cycle and the substrate that is being you know, utilized most significantly is going to determine how much carbon dioxide happens at the other end. Just as a quick example, the difference between if you, um, if you overfeed your patient so much that they are now producing fatty acids, additional fatty acids from that overfeeding, that carbon dioxide load can increase six to eight fold. So on the respiration, again, you're, we're not trying to create any more work for that patient. We're trying to get them in the absolute best state so that they're able to wean successfully. Now, in terms of those substrate uh, oxidation values, glucose is going to be anything between, say, a 0.85 to a 1. Lipid, pure lipid oxidation is going to be a 0.69. Uh, fat synthesis greater than a 1.01. If it's protein utilization, you're looking at a 0.81. If they're in ketosis, you're looking at a 0 0.60. Uh, this was also adapted from the practical guidelines for clinicians. So what was the support for the conditions that this patient had? Her Indirect calorimetry resulted in 1,309 kcals. Her enteral nutrition was increased then to 60 mLs per hour, which provided 1,526 kcals and 68 grams of protein. There was a little bit of padding added. The dietitian was not entirely certain, you know, what she was dealing with and provided a, a small addition to this because of you know, her, her clinical judgment. Now on day 11, again, because this paralysis was not improving, she had a peg placed and she maintains that mechanical ventilation. Now how about wound healing? The whole goal as this patient is continuing is for her to have uh, an improvement in the skin integrity. And in order to do that, you're, we need to have amino acids come into our body in order to create protein synthesis. All amino acids contain nitrogen. There are tests available that will capture how much nitrogen is in the urine. Two of those tests are called a UUN and a TUN. Now the UUN stands for urine urea nitrogen and a TUN stands for total urine nitrogen. Now, on the right-hand side, you see we've got the essential amino acids, or excuse me, on the, on the left uh, of this little, little uh, table. And then we have some non-essential amino acids. Now, the essential ones, of course, we have to receive from exogenous sources outside of our body. We're not able to make them, whereas non-essential, those are forms that we can make. And the conditionally essential are those that under stressed situations your body is going to require in order to support all of these body systems that will um, help you maintain homeostasis. In particular, I want you to take a peek at arginine, uh, glutamine, hydro hydroxyproline, excuse me, and proline. And we're going to talk about that in a couple seconds. Now, what about wound deterioration? If the patient has, is in this extreme catabolic demand, they are not meeting their needs. Meta, the me metabolic stress alone can increase the needs to the extent that, that, it's, that they have to catabolize muscle tissue or other tissues in order to help meet their needs. On the administration of that enteral nutrition was based on the indirect calorimetry at plus a 15% a amount was added to uh, the value. 
unfortunately with this patient by day 17 through 24, her wound that had started as a red area had increased in size to 3.5 by three centimeters and 75% of that was necrotic. So it was becoming very useful uh, to really try to depend on a direct measure tool and reduce dependence on predictive values. What I wanted to depict with this wonderful image was that when you are in need of wound healing, you utilize a substantial amount of oxygen. And imagine this patient is on a mechanical ventilator where she does not have you know, substantial control of little oxygen bursts in order for that oxygen to travel and be able to uh, access hypoxic locations or areas where there's maybe some, some ischemia or areas where they, it is a requirement that their additional oxygen is being utilized to prepare this wound bed. So your body is trying to create these environments that are going to get rid of the bacteria, get rid of the dysfunctional fibers and cells that are so damaged that they are no longer going to be able to sustain life. And in doing so, your body will produce these radicals. A super oxide anion is an example. So H2O2, you know, your basic hydrogen peroxide. Your body is creating this, trying to, again, uh, make these signals, this communication throughout all of the cells of the body that come, that's saying, come to this area. We have to um, all come together to make these repairs. It can also add a, a CL, you can see the next, uh, the next substance onto that and create a mild form of bleach to try to reduce those pathogens down. Now, if there's not enough oxygen, this system can go awry and overproduce, or it can lose the oxygen center and become necrotic. Now, we should visit about what these tests are able to, are able to test. Um, in particular, the urine, the urine urea nitrogen test um, is something that is going to identify how much nitrogen is in the urine in the form of urea. The whole point of detecting nitrogen is to determine, is there a nitrogen balance? When you see a wound growing, you are suspecting this catabolic state is not allowing for a nitrogen balance. So when you are consuming foods that have nitrogen in them, like all these different proteins and amino acids, and you are in a, a balanced state, the amino acids coming in are going to be equal to the nitrogen coming out. Whereas if you're in an anabolic state and you're building proteins, you are going to have a retention of some of that nitrogen. So all of the nitrogen coming in in the form of those proteins and amino acids is not going to be equal. You're gonna have less nitrogen on the other side because some of it's being retained to synthesize that protein. Now, you already are aware that, you know, if this is a catabolic state, I'm suspecting that it's, there's not gonna be that there's gonna be a negative nitrogen. And so that's the negative nitrogen is that the quantity of protein and amino acids coming in from, let's say from your enteral nutrition should, you should be able to calculate how much nitrogen should be on the other side of that. So if you find that well, all of that protein nitrogen that has come in, there is more pro, there's more nitrogen on the other side in that urine, you know it has been at the expense of a catabolic um, uh, process that definitely there are other uh, forms and of tissue that's being, that's being um, broken down to produce the rest of the nitrogen that you've detected. So where does all of this occur? This occurs in the muscle, the intestines, the kidney, and the liver. Um, if you look where there are some blue arrows that I added in here, you can also see in this, this top muscle um, diagram, the NH4. And that is because under a stressed state, your body is going to produce more ammonia. Ammonia has lots of nitrogen in it, but it is not detected by the, ure the urea test. Now, 
uh, normal, healthy individuals who are unstressed may have 80 to 90% of the nitrogen that's found in, your, in their urine in the form of urea. If you go down into this kidney section, you can see how this is all uh, turned into urea at the end as a byproduct at the end. There is a formula where you take your 24 hour total urine collection and you're going to test for urea plus you're going to add two grams of nitrogen for insensible losses and then there's an additional factor of three times 6.25 and that should equate to the grams of nitrogen at the end of the urea cycle of the of, of the urea cycle um, the UUN test is very inexpensive it's easily accessible especially in hospitals um, and it results very quickly the problem again is that these are very stressed individuals so even though this is accessible um, the variance in the amount of ammonia under highly stressed conditions versus the amount of urea that's produced in the urine does not equate to uh, a known variance because we are so individualized. So we can't add just a little factor to it or a little value to multiply at times because the, it's, it's just too individualized per person and based on the extent of stress that the, that the patient is under. The stressed patient, and I was kind of talking about this a moment ago, could have a urea production range of anywhere from 10 to 90% in the variance, plus this additional ammonia. And it's the form of stress, the illness, how much catabolism there is, and the hypermetabolic state that they're in. When you order a TUN test, it has to go to a specific laboratory in the US. There's only a few of them. So unfortunately, it may result in like five to seven days later. It is much more expensive uh, but it is also quite precise. When you think of that stressed patient, you know that they are under the most extreme of hyper hypermetabolic states because this cell signaling is trying to communicate something is severely wrong. So those proteins are going to be formed into cytokines, the tumor necrosis factors, um, the interleukins, there's going to be an increase in stress hormone. You remember your cortisol, your epinephrine, your adrenaline. Those are going to help to increase blood pressure. So you have a lot of perfusion and these, this communication process is most able to perfuse through all, the, through all areas of the body. Unfortunately, the catecholamines are also engaged in this cascade effect and they are gonna suppress the immunity because those proteins need to be utilized not to fight infection, but to go to the location where these areas are, where this greatest concern is. And it also creates insulin resistance. At the same time, your substrate use is entirely affected by increasing all the free fatty acids through the form of triglycerides by creating additional glucose, um, and it has been hypothesized that in particular for uh, respiratory ventilation patients, that they can lose 1.5% of their amino acids per day. That's, think, 10 days on a ventilator, and they could lose 15% of their body, their lean muscle tissue, Think about the size of that little tiny diaphragm. It's just, it's just a terrible, a terrible cycle. With all of this, there is this increased need for oxygen. That is the respiration required in the cell cycling. It's for ATP, you know, and here they are again on that respirator, you know, being mandated by controls that are not themselves trying to get bursts of oxygen, additional oxygen. All right, something I wanna mention about the TUN, uh, I, I said earlier that it directly measures the nitrogen, 
So you obtain it in the same way. You, you access a 24 hour urine collection and you are going to, that's going to equal the TUN, but you still have to add in some insensible losses. Insensible losses are going to come in the form of sweat and stool and hair and nails and just nitrogen loss that you can't account for in the urine itself. Um, the TUN is going to measure urea and ammonia. And then you, you add the factor of two on for the insensible losses. Something I do want you to be aware of that I just found really interesting. We were mentioning those amino acids earlier. The proline and the hydroxyproline have nitrogen in them. And if your patient is also under some form of a disease or process that's breaking cartilage down, which is not muscle mass, it's not muscle tissue, you're gonna detect that nitrogen in your TUN. If there are nitrites and nitrates from a UTI that were formed from bacteria, that will be detected. You know, you, and you know that if, the, if your patient has a UTI, they're gonna be treated for the UTI, but this is still, keep that in mind if you know they are being treated or, or, um, or they, you, you notice that they do have this UTI, okay? And then uh, also, when you look at arginine, I, I use this amino acid ex example because you can see all of the nitrogen bonds. There are more nitrogen bonds in something like this than there are you know, with an amino acid that has a single nitrogen bond. So if you are supplementing at the same time supplements that have a lot of glutamine and arginine in them, you know brand names of this, because of the additional nitrogen bonds that they have, that is going to be detected. So keep these things in mind. Uh, if it's just your a normal um, house uh, enteral feed, then you know that you're not supplementing with these high amount quantities of this. So just know that it will be detected if it's there, you know, if you are supplementing outside of that. Uh, we talked a little bit about the hypermetabolism and how this is also utilizing lots of energy and um, muscle tissue or lean, lean tissues. You probably remember that Aspen guidelines recommend initiating nutrition support within 24 to 48 hours. Now the ebb, the ebb and the flow phase of your patient just coming in, you know that the ebb will last anywhere from say two to 24 hours. Uh, and that's when there, there may not be hemodynamically stable patients and they're gonna get that fluid resuscitation. So once that is completed, then you're on. And the flow state is somewhere between say seven to 10 days. And these are states when you're gonna have marked hypermetabolic state. And then if you look off to the right-hand side at the image, this is just trying to depict again that you have to have substantial oxygen to these wound beds, to these areas of infection in order for them to, you see in the center, it shows a near anoxic necrotic core. It just is requiring a substantial amount of oxygen in order to support and, and obviously, you know, getting the calories and protein accurate uh, in order to make certain that you don't have substantial necrosis uh, continuing again and again. This particular patient had multiple debridements and had to take that uh, debridement down to the bone, which also was black. And so it took a, a significant um, uh, effort to be able to support the patient. This is a table of what the treatments were during the period of time that the patient had the greatest uh, changes. She came in on one form of, of one kcal uh, enteral nutrition. It was increased to 60 mLs. Um, she ended up getting a, the TUN ordered. The TUN was showing that she was going to require substantially more protein. And a protein module of 60 grams was added at the point that she had that necrotic uh, wound that needed the debridement. On day 45, it was pumped up. Again, the enteral nutrition was because her wound had gone from that state with debridement and increased to a size of eight 
by 1.5 with two centimeter tunneling. Her respiration was from no breaths of spontaneous uh, respiration on her own to up to one through eight on occasion. On day 45, there was such grave concern for her survival that it was all hands on deck and trying to make really the, the strongest possible effort for her to be able to survive this. Um, and, and she had an increase of 100 mLs uh, per hour continuous of her enteral nutrition, which equated to 2,400 kcals and 179 grams of protein. I want you to know that she did not have any uh, kidney dysfunction. The, her kidney and her liver um, labs were being followed closely uh, with hydration as well. Um, within about 72 hours, she had her first spontaneous breath, which then jumped up to five breaths uh, entirely on her own. On day 47, which was only 48 hours after that really in aggressive increase of nutrition um, support, she began having signs of granulation on that wound and producing serous fluid. At that point, she was also able to produce 13 spontaneous breaths on her own, and she was reduced down within a couple of days to just support with a CPAP. Luckily, this person was able to walk out of the hospital, and she continued to um, improve every single day uh, and improve that wound entirely until she was able to eat foods orally again and go to her therapy so she was able to, to fully recover. So the greatest complications are that when it comes to um, botulism, this, I'm gonna move this over. Um, gosh, I got myself off track, sorry about that. When it comes to ventilation and respiration, Sometimes you hear people describe ventilation as being, as being like a balloon, thinking of your lungs as a balloon, and that you inhale and it just inflates that balloon. But the reality is that oxygen travels only with protein carriers but on that hemoglobin. So in order to get the oxygen to cross over on those surface areas, you need to create more surface area, and that is what your body has done by creating these alveoli and increasing that surface area. Now, in a normal individual or a person who's not ill, I should say, they're able to fully inflate these alveoli, and we have something called surfactant that helps hold that open, so you have the greatest opportunity for surface area for that oxygen to travel over the alveolar um, membrane and into uh, the bloodstream uh, via the hemoglobin. Now in a normal and a healthy individual, I should say, you're gonna have anywhere from say 12 to 16 breaths per minute. Every time you inhale and you exhale, you're gonna have a volume in that lung of somewhere between three to 500 mLs. When you have a great big yawn, that's gonna be something like 1200 mLs. Now, you and I have got that surfactant. So we are able to take this nice breath in, the surfactant holds the alveoli open nice, nicely so they're not floppy and collapsed, and oxygen is able to travel on that hemoglobin. Whereas an individual who's in a critical ill state may only be producing like 40% of what that surfactant need really is. So that ventilator is going to have to put something in called positive end expiratory pressure, and that's known short as PEEP. There's going to be three to five centimeters of pressure that per end of every respiration that you have in order to produce that open alveoli. So you've got the greatest opportunity for oxygen to then uh, cross over and enter into the bloodstream again on your hemoglobin. Now, there are a couple of modes of ventilation as well. There's something called a control mode, and you think of that as the, like the iron lung. It is going to take care of everything for the patient. The patient has no ability to override. They are just receiving oxygen and they are expelling as well through that entirely controlled use. 
whereas this patient was on a support mode. So any effort that she had to draw, lung, draw air, oxygen into her lung, the ventilator was supporting this, and there was a setting to state she's going to need this amount of volume with this many breaths per minute if she isn't able to succeed on her own. Um, now, when we breathe air in, we receive about 21% oxygen. Whereas a person who is in her condition is going to not be able to receive the same amount of oxygen. She's not in control. And the only way to really understand that and to know what her oxygen levels look like are to get a series of blood gases. So those blood gases are going to help the providers determine how much oxygen is going to be de uh, delivered. And just as a reminder, that FiO2, which is that oxygen, and the PEEP are gonna to relate to oxygen, whereas the rate of breath and the total volume of breath is going to relate to the removal of carbon dioxide. So if you've ever seen an order written or you've gone through the respiratory notes, you might see something like this. This would be AC for assist control. Assist, that's supposed to be assist. Uh, 16 TV 550 ml FiO250 PEEP5. So that's going to be 16 breaths, total volume of 550 mLs with an oxygen, a fractional oxygen of 50% and a PEEP of 5. So you can see they're going to assist if she's not able to meet that 16 breath um, respiratory rate. It's that ventilator is going to assist with the 16 breaths, creating that 550 total volume if she does not bring that in, and they're going to add 50% of her oxygen needs with a holding, that end expiration, sort of holding pattern, holding that alveoli open uh, with that pressure of five. So I hope that's useful. So what's the prognosis? We know that we've got to be able to get to the point where there is protein synthesis occurring and that this patient is not in the state of catabolism, or at least to the extent that, that is causing wounds to grow and to have to uh, go in for additional debridements. Aspen's guidelines clinically uh, recommend 1.2 to 2.0 grams of protein per kilogram per day of actual body weight unless... Um, there, it's anticipated you're going to need more if you are in a traumatic state or you have a thermal, in, thermal injury. Um, I put this little table, probably very, it's kind of small, but I did put this on here. I think it's a fantastic reminder to um, really indicate of all of these proteins that our liver creates. And we know we've got to bring that amino acid in to be able to support that protein synthesis. When you have an uncontrolled inflammation or hypermetabolic response, look down toward the bottom until you see this section about a mm, little, little, little more than a halfway up, participants in the inflammatory response. Those portion of acute phase proteins and negative acute phase proteins are going to be reprioritized to in order to engage these cascades of systems to try to create different substrates for that patient for fuel, uh, to bring attention to where the body is believing that this, these infections are located. And the whole point of that is just to demonstrate how much protein is going to be shifted and utilized in different ways to try to bring metabolism or, um, trying to bring, um, what's the word I'm looking for, homeostasis back into play. The results from this particular patient was that when you look at figure one of the protein and wound size, you can see that she started with a zero wound. Her thigh had, little thigh wound had completely uh, healed, but unfortunately she developed a, a pressure injury um, that started with just redness of the sacrum and then became a significant injury. Look at how much protein was provided before that wound started to then 
become smaller and smaller and smaller. So the orange is the wound. You can see that uh, if surface area, let's say the greatest surface area is like 3,000, so 30,000 um, as, as sort of this idea of trying to identify wound size, you can see how the protein at a very, very high rate was provided and that wound just trailed all the way down until she was able to leave with leave that hospital walking on her own. And then this second figure is the protein grams versus the spontaneous respiration. What was interesting in this, the blue is going to be the total grams per day, whereas the orange is going to be the respiration rate. But the point is that really, she had a substantial increase in protein before she had a spontaneous breath that she took on her own. Pretty, pretty remarkable. What were the limitations of this particular study? This was a single case that the dietitian thought something really remarkable has happened and I wish we had the ability to use a TUN um, and that we had easy, easy access to that. Um, unfortunately, because it is just a single case, you're not going to be able to derive any type of correlation or relationship. It is the starting point that really describes something, something really remarkable has been observed, and we need to have additional research to support um, what exactly has, has happened. The methods were not controlled because this was a case that, that was, it was occurring, you know, and so maybe the 24-hour urine collection had variances. Uh, maybe it wasn't always on ice. Maybe there wasn't a exact quantities um, utilized each time. Unfortunately, the uh, indirect calorimetry was available only once, and then it had to go out for a software upgrade. And so it, was not, it wasn't available again after that. If we had had a series, I say we, I wasn't even there, if there had been a series that was available, there, might, there was, would have been more direct information to use, you know, and not just trying to gauge it by um, predictive methods. So moving forward, what do we really need? We need research, we need research in this area. I don't know about you, but I have not had the luxury of finding a great deal of information on enteral nutrition, protein needs, um, paralysis and ventilation. That is an area that is very fascinating, especially when you start to understand how those settings are used. Is there a possibility that we can start to use a TUN? If, if we know that the stressed patients are in need of having ammonia tested, is there a possibility that this is something that dietitians can begin to order, or at least be aware that a TUN is available? This is something that you, we could you know, talk to our providers and get them on board with. And then obviously, public education, safe lifestyles and changes, especially as it relates to weight control. The risk versus, versus the benefit of, my goodness, or the pressure, I should say, that this person was feeling that they needed to take such drastic measures in their own hands to produce a weight management opportunity. It just oh, hurts me to say it. Uh, we need research. Is it possible? Is it possible, you know, that we can use TUN to direct the administration of that protein? Um, and then obviously efficacy of early recognition and treatment of botulism. There are, it is still considered rare, you know, but it is becoming more prevalent because of the use of heroin. I was saddened to see that there was an outbreak in San Diego, California, there were nine patients who suffered with this wound obtained botulism. Seven were confirmed to have utilized black tar, heroin um, injected in beneath that skin surface, a wound developed, and they inadvertently exposed themselves um, due to that. Six of these patients were intubated and one succumbed. So it's this is in our, our beautiful California, and uh, it happens in, in state. If you go to the CDC, you can look this, these uh, uh, rates up in your own state. So uh, 
I hope this has been useful. I hope this is valuable for you. I want to um, thank my committee members again for being so phenomenal in this entire process. And uh, I'm, I'm happy that we've come to the end of this. I'm wishing you my best. If anyone has any kind of question and you'd like to email me, I'll just give you my personal email, denisecoventry at gmail.com. Thanks so much. We'll see you.